you got your Bible with you, turn with me to John chapter 18. Some of you guys are young enough or old enough to remember when we started, John, way back when. We've walked through the Gospel of John, and I want to remind you, because this is the beginning of the last section of John, and we've gone from chapter 1 all the way up until here, and uh, we have walked through these verse by verse, and that's kind of what we do here. Uh, but I want to remind you a little bit why we started John in the first place. Remember, we, we spent a, a, a lot of weeks talking about what the gospel actually is. And we took apart Romans chapter 1 through 8, and we just walked right through that and talked about the gospel. And we, we said, as we started John 1, 1, way back when, we said we wanted to take some time, uh, a lot of time, actually. It's been, al- it's been, I guess it's been almost two years now that we've been going through John. Uh, to focus our eyes upon Jesus, to turn uh, our eyes upon Him and to see Him, the one whom our soul loves, the one whom is our life, to, to bask in who He is and to, to see Him uh, closer, to grow to, to Him closer. Uh, we wanted to see Jesus. And that's why this gospel was written. When we get to chapter 20, John will say then that I write these things uh, so that you may believe on the name of the Son of God, and by believing in His name, that you, by believing in Him, you would have life in His name. So that's why this gospel was written, and everything that we've seen up to this point is going to culminate now in this final section, as we uh, Jesus has uh, finished teaching His disciples uh, until He goes to the cross. Anyway, we've looked at in the last uh, three or four chapters in that upper room discourse, the farewell discourse, as Jesus has been teaching His disciples things that they're going to need to know as He's about to go to the cross. He's told them that He is leaving them physically. He's told them that a betrayer is among them, that the Spirit is going to come and indwell them, that He is going to be with them. He's told them they will be united together and united in the triune God as the Father is in me. He says, I'll be in you. And we looked at all of those things, and now it all culminates in the events that are about to begin here in chapter, in chapter 18. He's told them all these things, and now He's going to show them. He's going to show them. The time has come. We've looked at this over and over in John. His hour was not yet. The time was not yet. They couldn't, they couldn't seize Him because His hour had not yet come. Well, now the hour is here. And it's against this dark scene that we're going to look at here in John chapter 18. It's against this dark events that are beginning that we see Jesus' attributes shine the brightest. Understand, as we look at these, we're going to see our Lord is not a victim by any stretch of the imagination. He's a, he is Lord of all, and He is in control of this situation. And we as believers today, we can rest and be safe in Him. No matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what's going on out in the world, no matter what comes against us and what the future holds, we're safe in who He is. You show me something that can change who He is, and I'll show you something that you need to be afraid of. So as we look at this, I want to paint the picture for you before we get started. But before we do that, let's pray and ask the Lord to bless our time and the reading of His Word this morning. Father, we love You. God, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you so much for the good news of your gospel, for what you have done for us. God, we come before you today and we just, uh, we beg for your presence. We beg for you to enlighten our hearts, to move upon us as we read your word, as we study what you have said, God, and we pray that you would speak. We're not here to hear what Jason thinks or his opinion. We're here to hear what your word says. So, Father, I pray that you would come and that you would minister to us in this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the first thing I want to do is I want to set the scene for you. That's what verses 1 through 3 in chapter 18 do. It kind of shows us what's going on. It tells us the location and the players and all the things that are going on to set the stage. And there are some very important details that we have to look at as we, uh, as we see who Jesus is in the midst of this and as He shows these people who He is in the midst of this. So it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas who betrayed him also knew the place for Jesus often met there with his disciples. 
So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Here is the scene that is set for us. It says, when Jesus had spoken these words, what words was, were we talking about? We're talking about everything that he said. He was teaching his disciples in the upper room, and as they were moving toward the garden, they left the upper room, they were walking, walking across the brook, they were walking across the, the valley, and into the, into the garden that was on the Mount of Olives. He was teaching them. He was telling them all the things that we've looked at in chapters 14, 15, 16, and the prayer that he prayed in 17. And finally, the teaching ministry of Jesus uh, in his physical life was done, and he was about to go to the cross. He would return, of course, in his resurrected body, and he would teach them again. But before the cross, his teaching ministry here is complete. He says, when he's spoken these words, he went out and they went to this garden. The garden in the other Gospels is called Gethsemane. You probably already knew that as well. But this just isn't any garden. It's not like they just walked out and found a garden and said, ooh, this is a good spot. No, this garden is where they often met. Whenever Jesus was in Jerusalem with his disciples, it said he went out of the city and he went out and prayed and he went out and taught and those things. He had been at this garden many times with his disciples and Judas even knew about this place where they often met. And so this was a well-known garden. I often think about what kind of memories these disciples and Judas himself would have of this garden where Jesus inevitably taught them and prayed with them and prayed for them and, and, and all the ministry that took place here. But I want you to see that this garden was well-known to the disciples. It was well-known to Judas. And that fact alone, because Judas knew, shows us that our Jesus here in this scene is not hiding He's not running. If anything, he is moving to this garden to make his arrest easier for the people who are coming to arrest him. Remember, it's been a long time since we've read it, but it hadn't been that many days that Jesus entered the city and the whole city was shouting, Hosanna! Praise Him. It's the Messiah. And they were, they were uh, uh, yelling and, and claiming Him to be Messiah so much so that the Pharisees said, Look, the whole world's gone after Him. And so I can imagine as they come to arrest him, maybe they were thinking, you know, I sure don't want to arrest him in a crowd. Who's, who knows what's going to happen? Maybe there's going to be a riot or, or whatever. And so this was the perfect place for them to arrest him because no one was around. It was secluded. It was outside the city. Jesus made it so easy for them. He wasn't hiding because he was going to the place that they always go to. He's going to the place where Judas knew that he would be. And the reason he's going is not to hide from the soldiers, not to hide from the religious rulers, but because he knew that the time had come. Look at how they came. He says, he says that Judas who betrayed them also knew the place for Jesus often met with, the, uh, with, uh, Jesus often met with his disciples there. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers... And some officers from the chief priests and Pharisees went there and they went with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Now, when you read that, those words, a band of soldiers, what you think of is about, I don't know, six people, 12 people, 20 people maybe. You know, just a, a tight little band. You know, and band of soldiers, depending on what translation that you have in your lap, it could be translated lots of different ways. If you have the NASB, it's a Roman cohort there. If it's a, you have NIV, it says a detachment. The Holman Christian Standard says a company of soldiers. New Living Translation says a contingent of Roman soldiers. The reason why there's so many different ways that this is expressed is because that word, the word spira, in case you care about those kind of things, it was used in Greek literature and in the Bible in several different places to describe a Roman cohort, which is one-tenth of a legion. One-tenth of a legion is a thousand soldiers. Now, there are other places in Scripture where that word, the cohort, is used for 400 to 600 soldiers. So it, it might not be a thousand soldiers coming in the garden. In fact, we don't exactly know how many, but I guarantee you it's definitely more than a dozen. It's definitely more than 20 or so. It's more than just a, a, a little group of soldiers that, that they got to come to the garden. It was a lot. 
And the reason why I say that, another reason why I say that is in verse 12. We'll get there eventually. He says, so the band of soldiers and their captain, and that word, I usually don't pronounce the Greek words because nobody cares, but this word is kiliarkos. And you know what a centurion is, right? How many men is a centurion in charge of? A hundred. Well, in Greek, kilios means a thousand and arkos means ruler. So this was a captain of a thousand soldiers, a captain of a cohort, a one-tenth of a Roman legion. Now, we don't know exactly how many men were there, but it was a big bunch of group of soldiers. I don't even know if that's good English, but that's how I'm going to say it. It was a bunch. In fact, in Matthew's account, chapter 26, verse 47, Matthew calls it a great crowd came to arrest him. And so, we don't know exactly how many there were, but there were a bunch. And I'm going to say on the short end, it might have been 200. Now, even even 200, now, if we just take that small number as the cohort that he's describing here, that still seems like overkill, doesn't it? I mean, you're going to get this, what they would think is just a rabbi, a carpenter's son. He's got 11 rag, well, they thought 12, but Judas was with him. 11 ragtag disciples with him. and they're go- It just seems like overkill. It seems like it, this is way too many for the task at hand. But you need to understand, that's Rome's M.O. That is what they did. That was their claim to fame, was to bring overwhelming force on their enemies. That's how they won victory after victory through all the skirmishes. That's how the Roman Empire took over the free world with overwhelming force and the discipline and training of their army. The Roman army, if you know anything about Roman history, especially at this time, they don't play. They fail recess. That's a joke. It's okay. Laugh. (laughs) They don't take chances. Jesus here is being accused, I mean it's false accusation, but the religious leaders are accusing him of sedition. They're accusing him of rebellion. And they're not going to take chances. They're going to send anything and everything they need to to make sure this little rebellion is put down. They take it very seriously. In Acts chapter 23, verse 23, you see that Rome dispatched 470 soldiers just to take Paul from Jerusalem to Caesarea. They don't play around. And these are Roman soldiers. Now, a lot of times we think of them, you know, we might think of them as like bumbling mall cops or something, riding around on a Segway or whatever. No, no. These guys are disciplined. That was Rome's claim to fame, the training of their army. They're not the B team. They're not goofy mall cops. They're battle-hardened Roman soldiers. They're the real deal. And if you were a Roman soldier and your task was to go get a prisoner or bring a prisoner somewhere else, you lost that prisoner, you lost your life. So it was a serious deal. And these Roman soldiers, this cohort, this band of soldiers, was accompanied by officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And so... What you see here, look at the scene. You've got Jews and Gentiles united together in their hatred against Jesus. For any onlooking Jewish person like Peter or John or all the disciples there, it would look to them like the whole world has come against Jesus. Jew and Gentile united to come and take him with lanterns and torches and and weapons and all of these things. They banded together against Jesus. And in this bleak picture, this very frightening picture, is where we're going to see who this Jesus is. The first thing I want you to see as we look at the next verses is that He is the Almighty God. Jesus is the Almighty God. So this band of soldiers, this, this, this what Matthew calls a great crowd, came to arrest Him. And Jesus, look at Him, He's not ignorant. He says, knowing all that would happen to him. He didn't just know about what they were fixing to do. He knew about what was going on. He knew he was going to the cross. He knew the suffering he would endure. He knew about the resurrection. He knew all that would happen to him. He steps forward and he says to them, who do you seek? He did not hide. Even as the whole world united against him, he stepped out and said, who is it you're looking for? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am. If you've got a he there, like the ESV does, that's added by the translators. You might, it might be in italics in your, 
in your version, which means it's added by the translators. He answered with two words, I am. Now, before we see what happened, John wants to make sure we know that what's about to happen to this group of people is about to happen to Judas as well. He says, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. Now, in the other Gospels, of course, you know, Judas actually came up to Jesus and kissed him to identify him through the, through the soldiers and the people that were coming to arrest him. And you might think, well, Judas just came up, kissed him, and stood right there with Jesus and waited for this thing to happen. No, Judas went back and stood with the army, with the cohort, with the, the people who were against Jesus. And John, before he describes what happens, he makes sure we know that because he wants us to know that whatever's about to happen is about to happen to Judas as well. Judas has chosen his side. He stands with the might and the power of the world and I am sure that he thinks he's on the winning side. But when Jesus steps forward and they say who are you looking for? Who are you looking for? And, he, and they say we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth and he says I am. The very name of God. Look what he says. When Jesus said to them I am they drew back and fell to the ground. He tells them basically the name, I am. We've seen that over and over again in John as we walk through John. Jesus uses the I am for himself. He uses the name of God himself, the name of God for himself. When the Pharisees came to him in John chapter 8, he said, Before Abraham was, I am. And they picked up stones and tried to stone him to death for blasphemy, for claiming to be God. And so what you see here is he says, I am. He gives them the very name of God, the name that God told Moses from the burning bush when Moses said, who do I say sent me? Who do I tell Pharaoh? Who do I tell the, the Jewish people in Egypt? Who do I say sent me? God said, I am who I am. You tell them I am sent you. And Jesus declares the name of God, claims the name of God, I am. And in the face of the very name of God, this great crowd of battle-hardened Roman soldiers falls to the ground. Picture it just a minute. This huge force of Roman soldiers, and I promise you, they're not mall cops. They, they diligently discipline and train. They think probably they're just coming to get some rabbi. Well, we got, we got another guy that's going to try to rebel against us. We need to go stamp this down. And they come upon this garden and they got 12 people in it. they got Jesus and 11 disciples, and they don't look like much. And with a word, with two words actually, when he says, I am, he knocks the entire group on their rear end. Soldiers from the greatest army the world had ever seen fall at the name of our Lord. It reminds me of the verse in Philippians where it says, the name of Jesus, every knee, is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. One way or another, either you'll bow the knee to Him in this life in service to the Lord of glory or you will be forced to your knees in judgment by the Lord who is glory. One way or another, His enemies are rendered helpless at the power of His Word. Church, make no mistake, Jesus here is not a victim. He's not a, a casualty of bad circumstances. He's not, a, he's not a victim of just evil plots, man. If all them people wouldn't have been just against him. He's not at the wrong place at the wrong time. He said, no one takes my life. I lay it down and I have the power to take it back up again. It reminds us today, even today in 2020, what Proverbs says, that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Today, the same darkness comes against the church, the body of Christ. The same darkness is, is still in the world as it was there because our world is still fallen. The same worry, fear, the same things attack us inside, attack our hearts as well. We got COVID going on, you got all these events going on, you got the election coming up, you got the future of the country and all those things. Understand, no matter what happens, Jesus Christ is on his throne. 
He has not abdicated his throne and will not. You can't change who he is. Events in the world can't change who he is. Anything going on in your mind, in your heart, or your life, or your trials, or your sufferings cannot change who he is. Now, I'm not saying that we should just not say anything. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be a prophetic voice to the culture. I'm not saying we shouldn't stand up against evil and injustice and let our voice be heard against those things. I'm not saying we shouldn't stand up and be heard about the evils of abortion and things like that. Understand, the Bible says to us that the innocent blood calls out to the Lord and they'll have their day in court. We must make our voices heard. But understand, Understand, no matter who's in the Oval Office, no matter who's in the governor's mansion, no matter who's in those Senate seats that we're going to be voting for, Jesus Christ is on his throne. In Psalm chapter 2, he says, The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heaven laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Jesus Christ is on his throne. Man, so often we're like, we're, we're like those disciples. What are we going to do? How are we going to make it? How are we going to fix this? How are we going to get out of this? Jesus is in complete control. He is almighty God, and there is nothing in this life, there's nothing in the next life, there's nothing in you or in anything out there in the world that can change who He is. There's nothing in your situation that you're facing today that can change who He is. And not only is He God almighty, but He is the good shepherd. In verse 7, this is, this, is my, this is the funniest part of all of Scripture, I think. So he just said, I am, and knocked them back on their rear ends. Now, it doesn't say this, so this is all my imagination. Take it or leave it. I can see them, you know, a Roman soldier was decked out in all this armor and stuff like that. And, and so I can see them struggling to get up and pulling the drawers up and all. What, I don't know what all they had on, but I can see them trying to get up. And as they're trying to get up, Jesus leans forward and says, Who would you say you live for? That's a lot funnier than me than this, y'all. It's okay. <clears throat> so he asked them again, Who do you seek? And they say again, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I'm he. I told you that I am, he says. So if you seek me, let these men go. Here in the midst of probably what we know is to be the most, uh, I don't want to say... Uh, I, I could say stressful time. He sweat blood in the garden. He was praying, Father, let this cup pass from me. He's thinking about his disciples. If you're here for me, let these go. Let them go. He's interceding for these men who are with him. Even here in this moment, he's thinking about his sheep. More than likely, the idea was, the plan was for these soldiers to round them all up. You see the same thing? You see that kind of played out in Mark chapter 19 in this same scene where the soldiers grab hold of one guy and he lets his coat loose and runs off in linen. They were trying to get them all. They were trying to bring them in. And what you see here is that our Lord is not like the hired hand. When the wolf comes, he runs off somewhere else to protect himself. No, when the wolf comes, our Lord steps out in between the wolf and his sheep and intercedes for them. Let them go. He tells us in verse 9, this was to fulfill the word that he's spoken. Jesus said this in chapter 6, and he said it in chapter 17. Of those whom you gave me, talking to the Father, I have lost none. He still intercedes today for you. He still intercedes for us. He will lose none of His. It says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him since He always lives to make intercession for them. Let me tell you what. Not only is our Jesus powerful, almighty God of all creation, he loves his own. When the heathen rage and the world comes against you, you have one that sticks closer than a brother. 
You have one who is for you. And if he is for you, who can be against you? John sees in this act the fulfillment of... Let me back up here. John sees the fulfillment of Jesus' words. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost no one. So you see here, he seeks their protection even now as they're coming to arrest him. And that is evidence of the eternal protection that we have safely in the arms of Jesus Christ. He will spare his disciples tonight because they're not ready to be taken and arrested. The Spirit has not yet come. They're not yet equipped. Now understand, there's no way for us to know what would happen if they actually had taken the disciples. But I suspect that the disciples would have folded up like a cheap suit. Even the most aggressive among them, Peter, who is going to start, he's going to take a sword in a minute and start hacking at stuff. Even he, in the very next section, is going to deny Jesus three times before people who are not even remotely as powerful as the ones that are standing in front of him. They're not ready to face these things. Now, I want you to notice one other thing. Jesus has already told them and he's told us that you will face trial, you will face persecution, you will face suffering and trouble. The 11 disciples that are standing here with them, save John, will all go on to die horrific deaths for the name of Jesus. All of them, including the Apostle Paul, will suffer greatly in their lives through persecution and beatings and jailings and all of this for the name of Christ. So the application for this is not that Jesus will protect you from physical harm all the time for all of your life. He'll protect you from all suffering and all trial. That is not the application here, for it was not the lives of the disciples. It was not the lives of the early Christians to be protected from it, and it's not been our lives to be protected from it. We will go through tribulation and hardship and suffering and trials and all of those things. But I want you to see here that Jesus did not allow them to be arrested, interceded for them because they were not ready. People often say, God won't give you more than you can handle. That is a great saying. It is so not true. In fact, God specializes in giving you stuff that you can't handle. And the reason is because He wants to remind you of your weakness. He wants you to grow in your dependence. But it does say in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide the way of escape that you may may be able to endure it. So no one can say, I had to sin. No one can say, I didn't have a choice. There was no way out. I had to sin. And so the point here is as Jesus intercedes for his disciples to not be arrested this night is not because he doesn't let us go through trials. The point is, it's not that he will not allow us to suffer. The point is that he will not allow anything into our lives that is not for our good. Romans 8.28 says, God works all things for good for those who love God and are, are called according to His purpose. He is the caretaker of His sheep. He is still today the good shepherd. He never leaves you, never forsakes you. He loses none of His sheep. He will not allow them to be destroyed. He will discipline you. He will chastise you. But what an assurance that we have That not only is He all-powerful, He also cares for you. And so when we do face trials, and we do face sufferings, and we do face persecution, we don't have to cry out, God, you left me. No, God works all things for good. We may not like it, but understand when the world comes against us, when all of life seems out of control when it seems like our prayers are not getting through the ceiling. That don't change who He is. He is still the Good Shepherd. And there's a reason why He must be and has to be the Good Shepherd. It's because of this last point. He is, well, that's not it, but He is the obedient Son. 
This is how he becomes our shepherd, because he obeyed his father. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it. If you look over in Luke um, 22, I think, 22, 38, right there, as they were leaving the room, Jesus told them to pick up the two swords. That's where the sword came from. He says, Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Good old impulsive Peter. Peter takes matters into his own hands. I often ask, the, I thought the, this week the question is, why is Peter so courageous right here? I mean, just in a few paragraphs, Peter's going to deny him in front of people that really can't do anything to him other than tell on him. How is he so courageous right here? The answer, the only answer I can come up with is, Jesus just knocked all these guys down with his word. He's standing with the Messiah who, with the power of, of God in his voice. The power of God in his word, of course. He just, Jesus just dropped them with his word. He's standing with the Almighty who could vaporize them with a word. Of course he's going to be empowered, emboldened. He takes things into his own hands and it says he took a sword and cut off the right ear of one of these servants. Now, when you read that, you have to come to one of, t- one of two conclusions. Either Peter is supremely a master of the sword or he's really terrible at it. (laughs) I take the second view. More than likely, he's aiming at the guy's head and just happened to cut off his ear. And so what you see is Peter's clearly unable to do anything. Clearly, he's, he's unable. He just starts hacking away, thinking he's doing something for Jesus. And Jesus stops everything. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Peter thought he was being brave. He thought, I'm going to fight for Jesus' cause. Next to Jesus with the power to knock everybody down. Peter said, I'm going I'm to fight for Jesus when really Peter was just in the way. If Peter would have succeeded, which didn't happen, couldn't happen, but if Peter would have succeeded, understand, in his fight for Jesus, he would have destroyed the church. He would have destroyed the mission. He would have destroyed salvation's plan. Of course, it couldn't happen, but if it were, he was fighting what he thought was right, but he was in the way. His efforts were fighting against God. And so we see in the other Gospels, Jesus heals the ear of this servant, and then he asks Peter, do you want me to not drink the cup that the Father's given me? In the Old Testament prophets, the cup of God's wrath is often what's talked about. Psalms and Jeremiah, Isaiah, even in Revelation, you see the cup of God's wrath. And that's what Jesus is speaking of here. He is about to take the wrath of Almighty God for sin, for the sin of the world upon Himself. And He's asking Peter, do you want me to disobey my Father's will? Stop it, Peter. I will not disobey. The first Adam disobeyed in a garden and corruption and death and sin issued forth into the world. The second Adam will obey his father in a garden and peace and reconciliation and life will flow forth from him. As I was looking at this this week, studying the passage, praying through it, um, I like to read other folks' take on it sometimes and there was one one person had a take on it and it basically it was pretty much the same thing that you know same way we've laid it out today but his conclusion was this his conclusion to this episode was so church you see we need to be like Jesus and we need to say not my will but your will and we need to take the cup of trial and suffering when God gives it to us now I agree with that I, there's, there's nothing wrong with that but he said We as Christians all have our Gethsemane. Gethsemane is the name of the garden. And so I got to thinking and I thought, no. No, church, you've never had a Gethsemane. Yes, you've had trials, you've had sufferings, you've had persecutions. But that's not what Jesus is facing here. Jesus stood strong, flat-footed, with no tears of blood and no 
praying God take this from me when he faced the devil himself in the wilderness as he was being tempted. Jesus stood strong against the religious leaders of Jerusalem as they tried to to seize him and plot to kill him and tried to stone him to death, and he did it with strength. Jesus is not facing just trial and persecution here. He is staring down the barrel of the full weight of the wrath of his Father for all the sin of the world. And that's why in the garden he prays, Father, take this cup from me. For the first time, as it were, the, the relation, a rift would be between the Father and the Son as Jesus becomes sin and the Father pours out all of his holy hatred and wrath for sin upon his Son. No, church, you never had a Gethsemane and that's the point. Jesus took it for you. He drank that cup so that you will never have a Gethsemane if you are a believer in Christ Jesus. That cup of wrath that Jesus drank that was poured out upon him is empty now for those who have trusted in him and are united with him in his death and his burial burial and his resurrection. You have never had a Gethsemane experience and praise God, you never will. You will never face the cup of wrath because Jesus has drank it down and it is empty. There is a a hymn. It's called, Christ, What Burdens Bowed Thy Head. And there's a line in that hymn that says, Death and the curse were in that cup. O Christ was full for thee, but thou hast drained the last dark dregs. It is empty now for me. Believer, you can't change who he is. He is the good shepherd, he is the almighty God, and he is the obedient son in your place. No matter what you face in this life, you can't change who he is. No matter what enemy comes against you, they can't change who he is. No matter what circumstance that plagues you in this life, or trial, or suffering, or attack, or whatever else, it cannot change who Jesus is, and that is where our hope lies, in who Jesus is. So we will never... In this life, we will suffer, we will have grief, we will have sorrow, we will go through all of those things, but we will never have reason to fear. For Jesus is Almighty God and He cares as the Good Shepherd. And because He is the obedient Son that took the wrath of His Father, we're safe. We're saved. Even if we live a life of suffering to the day we die. It cannot be compared to the glory that awaits us. Now, today, if you're here and you don't know Christ, you've never trusted in Him, you've never given your heart and life to Jesus, there is a cup waiting for you. You haven't experienced it yet either. You haven't had a Gethsemane experience either. You look around and, you know, life is relatively good. You know, I'm blessed. I got my health, got sunshine, got my breath, got a heartbeat. All those are gifts from God. I'm doing okay. Life is good. Understand, there is a cup being stored up for you. One day you will stand before the judge and that cup of wrath full to the brim will be poured out upon your head and you will pay it for all eternity. But today, right at 12 o'clock, I did good today. Right now, this moment, there's a door. Right now, this moment, there's a key. Right now, this moment, there's a way. Stop playing games. Stop halting between two opinions. If the Lord be God, serve Him. You can give your heart and life to Christ and be saved. And that wrath for your sin, that punishment for your sin, will be gone forever. And you will never, in this life or the next, be punished for sin. It was given as a gift to us on the cross of Calvary and the resurrection from the dead. The Son of God gave Himself for you. Give your life to Him. All who call upon the name of the Lord, the Bible says, will be saved. One thing I didn't mention real quickly, when Jesus knocked that whole group of soldiers down, 
That was such an act of grace. It was such an act of grace because he revealed himself to them. They fell to the ground and not into hell. And in that moment, as I'm assuming they were getting themselves to their feet, they had an opportunity. They had a revelation of who this was that they were standing before. Today, he's revealed himself to you and you have an opportunity. Don't let it go by. Where will that cup be poured out? On your head or upon Jesus?